You don't know who enemies or friendlies are. You have no clue. Nobody wears uniforms, no idea. So you can't just start shooting people because they have a gun. You have to basically wait till they shoot or attack you first. I remember I tried to get in there. I was like, okay, I can do this. <sighs> Sucked it up and I ran in. And then just hit me. I was like, oh, that's a mortar. It's gotta be. And I went, mortars, mortars. Take. And as soon as I said take cover, I saw the first one hit backside of building C. My head, I'm like, oh my, I just watched my team get obliterated. And I put my head down. I did. That was the one point that night where like, Crap, I can't beat this. I'm Chris Pirano. I was a security contractor, and this is my war story. It was September 11th, 2012, and we were in Benghazi, Libya. Myself and Dave Benton, he was Boone, is his, his call sign, and if you've seen the movie 13 Hours, uh, that's how you recognize him. Him and myself had actually extended an extra three weeks. We were supposed to go home three weeks prior. So we were just, you know, trying to just finish and chomping out the bit to get out of there. Cause we had about, I'd say about a week left and we were watching a movie and we were on what was called QRF, Crook Reaction Force. We were the uh, small two man team that if necessary, we could go out and help our own personnel out in town. It could be anything from them getting involved in a firefight to them getting blown up to just even a flat tire. And we were just waiting for Oz. Oz was out on, on the final operation of the night and we were waiting for him to come home so we could get another day down and get one day closer to going home. We got a call and I remember it being 932 and it was our GRS team leader and he said, we need all GRS in the team room now. And I, you know, I get chills thinking about it even right now because there's that sense of urgency that you can hear in a voice, just that slight panic, even when they're trying to hold it together, that you know something's going on. And we got our gear and we headed out the door. And immediately as we headed out the door, you could see the firefight. You could see the tracers at the U.S. consulate, the State Department facility. We're three quarters of a mile away and could see the red and the green. The tracers going up in the sky from a AK-47 or a PKM, a belt fed. And you heard the explosions from the RPGs. And you just saw the team, fantastic group of guys starting to move and starting to get ready because we needed to get our gear and possibly get out the door and assist. Five minutes, we're good, we're ready to go. And I remember I'm walking and I walk up to my chief of base who's standing here. I walk up to my team leader who's standing here. Both have minimal military experience, but they're in charge of us, they're CIA employees. And I say, hey, we're ready to go. And I remember the chief looked at the team leader and he said, tell these guys I need to wait. Now I'm standing right here. And I know these guys, I've worked at that with them in other bases. But when he looked at me, kind of looked through me and then he looked at the team leader and told the team leader, hey, tell these guys I need to wait. And I'm right here. But yeah, that got me a little, little miffed, a little pissed. And the team leader actually had the gall to look at me. He turned and looked at me, he goes, you need to, and I stopped him, I go, I got it, man. And I walked back to the car and, and Tyrone says, what's going on, Tano? And I said, uh, Bob's telling us we gotta wait. That was hard, that was really hard to do because uh, you, you can see the firefight. You know the State Department guys are getting crushed and they have a high level ambassador over there, Chris Steven, and he's over there and, and they're just, they're getting hammered. But you wait, they're in charge of us. That's what we're trained to do. We, we know what we need to do. We are leaders in our own right, but those guys are the guys that are in charge as far as the CIA employees. And we just, we just did that for the next 10 minutes. And then it went to 15 minutes that we're waiting. And as that 15 minutes turned to 25 minutes, that, that's when we heard Alec Henderson say, GRS, if you don't get here, we're all gonna, we're all gonna die. And um, I remember hearing that on the radio. Now, keep in mind, we've been hearing him ask for assistance for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> and when he said that, the whole team knew, was, we gotta go. That motivated me even more. And we shot out the gate. So about 10 o'clock that we actually headed out the gate and uh, we drove down uh, to the consulate thinking we could get in the front gate, get them all out and get them out of there. And that didn't happen. 400 meters from the consulate, we're supposed to make a right down a dirt road. There's a local group there that looks like they're fighting back, but then it also looks like they're just running around like cats, like scared cats, like somebody's throwing a firecracker at cats. And we start moving to where we're supposed to make a right hand turn off gunfighter down a dirt road to the front of the consulate, which is 400 meters down the road. And as you get closer to the, to the wall and you see a guy fight, there's one local that's fighting. I remember he was at a PKM. He's going, he's, brrr, and he's shooting down the road. Get closer, you start hearing snaps. Some of y'all that watch this, I'm sure you know what that is. The snap is when a high velocity round goes by your head, it breaks the sound barrier. It goes snap, 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 and you just start hearing snaps everywhere. You don't know who enemies or friendlies are. You have no clue. Nobody wears uniforms, no idea. And again, I'm watching a team not say a word, nobody panics, and they just start moving into position to return fire. And I see Tig with our 40 millimeter grenade launcher. He starts lobbing rounds, and we split at that point. We split. 
when they first called us at 932, it took us almost an hour and a half to actually get a three quarters of a mile into the compound. It was fire everywhere, black smoke from the diesel and people start to scatter and we start clearing these compound. It's, I hate using the word surreal. It's just something you can't make up. You can't fabricate anywhere else. The only place you're gonna see stuff like that is in combat. We cleared that compound and we found, uh, found five survivors. About 11.30, we were taking turns running into this burning villa trying to find the ambassador. And I remember it was my turn and I tried to run in and man, it was like hitting a pizza. I mean, I just hit a wall, just wham, hit. It's like running into a pizza oven. I remember I tried to get in there. I was like, okay, I can do this. <sighs> Sucked it up and I ran in and uh, I couldn't find him. So I came back out. That's when Boone came up and said, we lost one. And um, <clears throat> my heart dropped, it, it was hard. And I ran to the front of the building to see what was going on. And I saw them pulling Sean Smith and he was dead, smoke inhalation. And I saw Scott Wicklin. He started kind of going to shock. We had to go get the classified information because all that State Department guys had forgotten it. So Jack and I ran back over there to get it. Long story short, we threw all the classified information in the back of the State Department guys SUVs. SUV, they had one. And as they go out, you know, they're starting to leave. There's a huge explosion. And as the explosion, I remember a guy ran, a Libyan ran by me, he's missing his hand. And I remember I pulled my gun up because I didn't know what was going on. I was pointed right at him. There's a guy behind him that has pieces of his hand chasing after him. Your mind is trying to figure this out. As I go back to my position, another explosion goes off. And this one rocked me pretty good. Luckily, I was on the back side of the villa. So all I caught was really the overpressure and some debris. But it was an RPG and we got counterattacked. We did best I could to fight it off. And I remember seeing the SUV take off as that happened after, and I was trying to use it for cover, and then it took off. They went right instead of left. And I remember hearing Jack and Ty on the radio go, and you guys are going the wrong way, and they got crushed. We couldn't do anything for them. And we fought off the counterattack, and about midnight, we finally got a drone overhead that I was starting to hear. And the drone, the ISR was telling us, you guys need to get back to the annex, uh, that it's gonna get counterattacked. And we did. We left, we went back to the annex and we left the ambassador. He was dead. He was found in a safe room, which we couldn't get back far enough into. He was found later by the locals when the fire died down and they pulled him out, but we left him and that hurts. The State Department guys that went right, and said they got ambushed, they fought through that ambush. He got back to our compound on run flats thing was shot up. I, it was still burning. The run flats were still burning the next morning. They got lucky. They got lucky because the RPGs missed. The positive on our compound is we practice defending our compound. We have areas that we can defend. So we know where we need to go and we wait and we start to see these guys move on us. And as they're moving, I'm trying to clarify because they're using houses to come through us. And you know, everybody has guns over there. Even though you're not supposed to, everybody does. So you can't just start shooting people because they have a gun you have to basically wait till they shoot or attack you first. And we're watching them move. And I remember watching them through this area we call zombie land. They're coming through moving. And as they're coming, I got my infrared laser on my rifle. I'm pointing on my M4. I'm pointing at each guy saying, hey, do you see that guy? Do you see that guy? And everybody on the radio is beautiful. Again, it's like a symphony. Everybody's on the radio is going, got him, got him, got him, got him. It was such a confident feeling even though they were moving at us with more people than we had, knowing that we were all on the same page. It didn't take us that long. I bet it only took us maybe five minutes, six minutes to fight those guys off. And, and we, we handed them their ass, we did. And uh, we got attacked again at 3 a.m. And this time was a massive force. The movie did a fantastic job showing that. I mean, they're just coming wave after wave and we're just, we're not holding back now. We're taking them out and we did. About 5 a.m., we get word that Bub Glenn Doherty, his team is coming in from Tripoli. Now Bub died that night as well. They found a way to get to us, and they did. They got to us at 5 a.m. Bub came up to building C. I'm on building A, so we've got building B, A, C, and D. And I hear a shh. I go, did you guys hear that? I'm on the radio. I said, did you guys hear that? And they just hit me. I was like, oh, that's, that's a mortar. It's got to be. And I went, mortars, mortars. Take. And as soon as I said, take cover, I saw the first one hit backside of building C. And I see another boom. And I see a guy go out of the fight. It was Dave Ubin. Well, as I turn around again to make sure we're not getting counterattacked, because we're still getting attacked from that area, nobody's coming. I see a boom, boom, boom. My head, I'm like, oh I just watched my team get obliterated. And I put my head down, I did. That was the one point that night where like, oh, crap, we can't beat this. We ain't got any air support. We got nothing to fight mortars. God, to me, that's what I heard. I said, God said, get your gun up, Ranger. And I got my gun up and I kept, <clears throat> I kept shooting. Do you fight through it? You just fight through it. You gotta, you gotta keep going. You can't quit. You can never quit. Cause you're gonna find a way. 
as that happened, I saw Tig get up there, and I, you know, Tig could tell you better than I could. He got up there, he saw Oz actually, Oz's arm had been almost sheared off. Oz was already trying to get a tourniquet on his arm. I actually, Oz even tried to fight through a little bit of that, but he couldn't because his arm was hanging. He said he saw Bub, Bub was in the fetal position. Bub was face down, he checked him to make sure his vitals uh, were okay, but they weren't, Bub was obviously dead. He went to Tyrone, he says, I started to check his vitals, and he said, Tyrone went to the last breath, and he said I checked his vitals, and he's, he's, he's dead. And then he saw Dave, and Dave is actually, Dave's messed up. Trout bleeding out of his face. I, I, they said there's a militia coming in, and I said, well, can you tell me what they look like? Because there's only three guns left. It's me, Boone, and Jack Silva. Because Ron's dead, Bub's dead, and everybody else is basically hiding in Building C. Nobody's coming up to help us. And they couldn't tell me. Hey, can, Chief TL, can you tell me what they look like? We don't know. Can you tell me how many? They said 30 to 50, including technicals. They, I saw that militia coming, and it was my job to make sure they were good guys. If they weren't, I had to stop them. <laughs> All I had left was my M4. And uh, I remember seeing it. I, I remember I got down and I got behind this parapet wall because every wall over in the Middle East, North Africa, it's all flat with three foot high parapet walls. And I got as small as I could. And I wasn't, I'm like, hey, I, it's Ferris Bueller line. You could have put a lump of coal in my butt, it would have become a diamond. I remember I put my red docks this daytime and I put it on the front guy's vehicle and I put it on the uh, passenger side of the guy because I'm thinking he's a commander and he's chewing what we call cot, which is basically Copenhagen mixed with steroids and cocaine. And it looked like he'd been chewing it since he was probably one or two years old, because it's just disgusting. And they chew it because it's amphetamine. It gets them spun up for battle. And all I could think of, and this wasn't a movie scene, this wasn't dramatization, I just went like this. Nine times out of 10, if I threw that thing up and I got it back, I knew they were friendly. And it was all I could think of, I was tired. <laughs> and I went, and the guy in the front vehicle smiled, and, and he went like this. And I knew we were okay. And I got on the radio and I go, they're with us. And uh, yeah, I, I, I tear. I, I just all that tension. Just <sighs> holy crap! Finally, some help. We had to get Dave and Oz to the airfield because they're bleeding out. They're losing a lot of blood. And so we got in that convoy and we took off. We're the biggest, baddest convoy in Benghazi. Nobody's gonna mess with us. <laughs> and so we got on the airfield. If Bub wouldn't have got that jet there, we would have two more deaths. But because he never gave up, we were able to get all of our non-shooters and all of our guys, Dave and Oz, that were bleeding out onto that plane and that flew back to Bank, uh, to Tripoli and they were saved by Libyan doctors and they were managed to stabilize them and uh, SF-18 Delta, Special Force 18 Delta that was actually in Tripoli. We waited, the rest of us had to wait because there wasn't room and at 10.30 a C-130 landed. I don't care what report you read, that thing landed, parked, shuts its engines off. I looked at the team leader, I said, is that for us? He didn't know. We went down there and we talked him into flying us out. Now, the rest was history. After that, I went home, and then after eight months of seeing the story being misconstrued and politicized and, and basically being lied about, the team, and that was the beauty of that team, the team made a decision to tell the truth. It wasn't one of us. If it would have been one of us, it wouldn't have happened. But we came together and we, we suffered for it. We were fired, lost our security clearances, and uh, I never contracted again. That's basically it, being honest. If you would like to put your war story on, please use the comments below to request that. To all you men and women who served, especially you Vietnam veterans, welcome home. The rest of you veterans out there, thank you for your continued service. And law enforcement, first responders, thank you for keeping us safe in this great nation.